Hi everybody, this is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, I do believe we're going to be finishing up our discussion on emotional intelligence and where it lives on the change grid. Uh, when we last left off last time around, we were talking about the genus uh, list of core emotional intelligence competencies, and we were starting to have some dialogue around what appears to be a continuum. Uh, so between the unproductive states and the productive states, um, when you overlay this on the change grid, you start to realize that there are many stopping points between those two states. And there may even be states that are more productive than the one they've listed, or even less productive than the one they have listed. So today, what I want to do is just have a deeper discussion around that and get that discussion going. What I've done is I've pulled out the um, a page. In fact, let me chat this page over to all of you. And then you can look at it locally, you might find this a bit handier. I just went over to Genos's website. And they have this uh, explanation of their model. So I've just chatted the model over to you. And on that page, you will find this diagram in a different color combination. But then they give brief explanations of what each of these competencies is all about and what they mean by these uh, productive and unproductive labels that they're putting into place. So um, yeah, so we'll work our way through this and see what it's all about. Now, as a way to get everybody back on track, remember when we looked at the change grid in our first three discussions on emotional intelligence, we established that emotional intelligence, as it's described across multiple authors, multiple researchers, multiple models, tends to live in four subquadrants on the change grid. So some of the behaviors associated with emotional intelligence would plow out as being an expressive driver kind of an energy. So anything having to do with rallying people around and you know, conveying any sort of enthusiasm, sharing a mission, vision, purpose, all those good kind of communication, influential sorts of skills are going to be at their best here on the change grid, where we perceive the level of ability as being moderate to moderately high, but the challenge is also being quite high indeed. Some of them were also going to be more amiable driver sorts of qualities right here in this subquadrant. This has to do a lot more with nurturing behaviors, teamwork, um, listening to others, understanding feelings, all that good sort of thing. Um, and uh, then we also had some that were going to be more of an analytical expressive. So an analytical expressive is first and foremost an expressive. So they're communicating, they're interacting, whatever, but they tend to be sharing things with a little bit more uh, of a dose of data, a dose of factual sorts of stuff. I mean, the domain of factuality is down here in the analytical quadrant, but there's a secondary element of it here where we're looking. And then there's also the, uh, the, the driven expressive. And we talked a lot about the driven expressive a couple of calls ago where we said, this is the schmoozer. This is the person who doesn't really feel like they got the ability to be influential. So they turn on all the charm and all those good sorts of things. Well, if you really break down everything that's been said about emotional intelligence, um, you'd find that pretty much everything they have to share about what is emotional intelligence, what behavior does that include, tend to live right here on the change grid. Well, that's four out of 16 subquadrants, which would imply that the other 16 are somehow or another lacking in emotional intelligence. So last time around, we talked about whether or not emotional intelligence was innate or learned. And what we ended up uh, coming to was that there is certainly innate factors to it. Some people are born with a lot more emotional intelligence in their personality and their DNA or whatever. Um, but a great deal of what is considered emotional intelligence is something that we learned. Um, and because it's something that we've learned, it's something that we can consciously decide to either pull into play or set aside. And the problem with a lot of these subquadrants, like the driven driver, is the driven driver characteristically doesn't have very much innate emotional intelligence to begin with. They're the bull in the china shop. They're the bully. Um, uh, could they display emotional intelligence? Yeah, because as we said last time around, we know they were probably raised uh, to be a little bit poor, uh, polite, be considered, be all those kinds of things. But for whatever reason, they may be choosing not to do that, setting it aside altogether. And we gave as an example last time around that we can't say that a driven driver or that CEO that's the bull in the china shop or whatever is 
always neglecting emotional intelligence because we said, what if they're sitting down at a conference table with a giant potential investor in their company? It's amazing how quickly that uh, driven driver, that outgrade danger zone sort of person, uh, can suddenly find their manners, can suddenly find uh, their their uh, what do we say their their interaction, their uh, personality. You know, they they can do it now. Are they comfortable doing it? Do they like doing it? Not so much. And so as soon as that's over and done with, no surprise, they're probably going to revert back to what is most natural for them. And we, we continued our discussion around all the other areas around the change grid. So so that's, that's where we're all at. So when we decided to look at genomes, we said, well, if what we have learned so far by performing this little integration into the change grid holds true, then all of these things that Genos is saying are productive states should occur in one or a combination of those four subquadrants. And all of these unproductive states should be outside of those. And so that's what we wanted to chat about uh, today. So um, before we launch into that, I'll open it up. Any comments, any thoughts anyone wants to share? That's good. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, and so, Brian, I'm going to have a question for you in just a second, because I don't think you were on our last call and we had a couple of questions for you about these four subquadrants. Specifically, uh, we'd love it if you could explain the neurotransmitter activity that's happening there and why that might bring forth emotional intelligence. While you're thinking about that, I noticed we've been joined by Boris Blum. And so Boris is someone that I've been chatting with for the past few weeks. Um, I, I, um, I think he's absolutely fascinating. So I'll, I'll let him go ahead and take a moment to introduce himself. So Boris, you wanna share with the circle who you are, what you're all about? Sure, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, so I am the CEO of a company called My CEO. We are a global independent consulting network that focuses on working with successful uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs of companies, and, uh, helping them kind of recover and reinvent uh, from what they've experienced in the last year or so. Uh, the company started out of uh, COVID um, and, and sort of the transition that we see happening in the marketplace. Uh, but the way that I got to the point of starting this company was because I had been a crisis consultant and a turnaround expert with companies for years uh, since the last financial collapse. Uh, my background is primarily in finance um, and I, I've done everything from being an individual contributor to running distribution for Fortune 100 multinational um, in the financial services space. And so my experience has been is working with uh, entrepreneurs that are highly successful. Those are my ideal clients and who I'm passionate about working with. Um, and I'm looking at ChangeGrid as how we can utilize this tool to better understand uh, why things are not working at times. Um, we all know that some people uh, are productive at times and not productive at other times. And so helping them be productive on a more consistent basis is uh, something very important uh, to me in the work that I do with uh, clients. Uh, I love working in the crisis space primarily because crisis brings to itself a very unique situation where somebody's back is up against the wall oftentimes. Uh, and based on that fact, uh, they will do things they, they normally would not do. And some of those things are good and some of those things are uh, kind of counterproductive. Um, so I've seen people self-sabotage themselves in a variety of ways uh, due to crisis situations, but I've also seen people rise to the occasion uh, and just uh, do phenomenal things. So uh, I, I view the change grid as an interesting tool to help not only explain, but uh, also help implement um, in the process of change for these individuals to make them more productive. So. Well, welcome, welcome to the circle. Yeah. And so, um, so as everyone else, if you're contributing something, you might want to take a moment just to share uh, who you are, what part of the country you're in, what kind of work you happen to be doing. Uh, so Boris gets a sense of who else is joining him in the circle. I've been inviting Boris now for the past couple of weeks to join in on this, particularly, I thought this discussion around emotional intelligence would be very useful because he's in crisis management. He's turning around com companies that are really struggling 
well, how much of that struggle is going to end up revealing who's got any emotional intelligence to start off with and who might have some, but's choosing not to bother <laughs> to pull it into play. And what do you do about that? Because um, Boris, what we've come to is the uh, the realization again? The circle is all about merging all different sorts of forms of brilliance into our model. And uh, one of the things we've kind of learned is that emotional intelligence isn't really who you are as much as it's how you happen to be behaving. So a lot of the emotional intelligence training programs going out there is really teaching people what they probably already know that they have consciously decided not to put into action or they are at a location on the change grid that in and of itself inhibits their ability uh, to pull those kinds of things into action. We do try to figure out is there is there an organic reason why it's happening as well, which is now going to get us into Brian's little contribution here. So Brian, what's going on with neurotransmitters that might trigger someone to display their emotional intelligence? Well, you know, it's really exciting to hear what Boris is doing. Because I happen to sit on the board of a couple of startups, and I have this conversation with them. And as a physician and clinical investigator, I use a lot of uh, sports medicine research to kind of help them understand how to manage their physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual energy. And that's where the change grip comes in. But I think the key thing when it comes to emotions is to understand at a basic level, the emotion is a mechanistic response. Like the body picks up on something. And that's why behavioral scientists, when they're studying this, and I said, when they used to come to the laboratory and neuroscience labs, they're not, they say they're not studying what we call a feeling, they're studying a trigger. Like they wanna know what triggered it. Is it internal, is it external? But something in the environment triggered something and our cortical processes, or the cortex, where we think about things, is only catching up where the body has already been. So that's the first key. The self-awareness come in when we say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm upset because, or this happened. And then we can reasonably label it for relevancy, for meaning, for purpose, so that we can now effectively utilize that emotion. So you get essentially an adrenaline hit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that adrenaline hit can take a path depending on your response where you go full out into, you know, we looked at that on the change grid, how you have dimensions of adrenaline. Yes. Um, so you start with the noradrenaline, and then you can get to a full adrenaline. And when the key thing is when those processes from the midbrain that operates like 10 times faster, than our reasoning capacity. So when those processes by law of proximity is near the amygdala, when they're enacted, there's not a whole lot of reasoning. So you have to shift that, that what we call a Diane Buffett method. You have to be able to shift and know how to do that or else you're just gonna be literally, we call it amygdala hijacking. You're gonna be hijacked because your body is responding to something in the environment the adrenal gland, so all your resources and energy is marshaled to your extremity so you can fight or flee. Like when that process, so in the, essentially amygdala, and it's on both sides of the brain, right above the ears, that's the body's alert system. So it's always doing this environmental scanning to make sure that you're safe. Mm -hmm. So whenever something triggers and that system comes on, you have to learn how to understand what's going on with your body in that moment. And that's, oh. these are autonomic nervous system processes. So they happen automatically. They don't ask for your permission for it to happen. <laughs> So, Brian, let me share a couple of the diagrams just as a reminder. And everybody remember the Circle of Brilliance talked about um, all the neurotransmitters. It's got to be the better part of a year ago now. And we had several sessions on it. I don't know, a good eight, 10 hours that we devoted to this subject. Well, to what Brian just said, the norepinephrine and noradrenaline tends to be at its strongest. Um, well, it tends to be connected to the perceived level of challenge. And so when there is a significant level of challenge, uh, then we're going to have that noradrenaline, norepinephrine is going to be more present or more in play. Uh, if the level of tension is too low, or rather the level of perceived challenge is too low, it tends to diminish as well. Well, beyond the noradrenaline, if we click on this one, 
this is pure adrenaline. And so now there really is some sort of a, of a threat. And Brian, feel free to correct anything that, I, that I'm saying. So across all of these, these uh, I'm going to say eight quadrants or eight subquadrants, the two main quadrants, the expressive quadrant, driver, outgrid, and upgrid, we're finding a lot of noradrenaline and a lot, uh, or, and where adrenaline would be at its strongest. Now, I want to throw two other things in here. One is dopamine. It's interesting that when we look at these four subquadrants that are associated with emotional intelligence, while there might be some dopamine activity, that extreme activity found very far upgrid or outgrid is not happening. So Brian, in a second, I'm going to say, how is it then the dopamine undermines someone's emotional intelligence? So that'll be coming your way in just a jiffy. <laughs> um, and then this one was about serotonin. So if you look at where the, these four subquadrants are for um, emotional intelligence, there's a good dose of serotonin coming into play. Now, truly serotonin is more of a radial trend on the change grid. So it's strongest at the center and diminishes as it goes out. It's the opposite of dopamine. We can look at them both like this. Um, so we've got a good deal of serotonin in play but no dopamine or no high levels of dopamine. So Brian, anything you wanna share with us about dopamine compromising uh, emotional intelligence? Yeah, see so this is why, this is where like when adrenaline and noradrenaline, something triggers you, that idea of mo the cornerstone emotional intelligence of self-awareness, the ideal is that serotonin bringing you back inward. So now you say, oh, okay, this is why I'm triggered. And so now you're left with to deal with it because without that, and you just respond or more appropriately react, you're literally conditioning yourself to respond to a crisis in that way. And that's where that dopamine comes in. Remember, dopamine only cares about dopamine, doesn't care if it's value driven or not. And it so more, yeah. mm -hmm. it just wants more of it. Yeah. But there's something called a dopamine prediction error reward says re that even that, the anticipation yeah. Brian, just, dopamine, repeat, just repeat that because we, uh, we lost you there for just a second. There's something called the dopamine prediction error reward. Uh -huh. So that says that even in the anticipation of something, so that whereas when it's intense and there's emotion involved, you can get the same amount of dopamine as if you actually, the event actually occurred. Uh -huh. So and the anticipation itself leads leads to these conditionings. And so this is why it's important to do the self-awareness analyses. Mm -hmm. And let, let me throw in a, a couple practical scenarios. And by the way, the rest of you, feel free to unmute and chime in uh, as we're doing all this. You will, uh, what Brian said about fight or flight, you know that we talk about what the four responses are to a real threatening situation or the four uh, kind of survival mechanisms are flight, which occurs in the upgrade danger zone. So ability is very low, perceived challenge is extremely high. And so our goal is to just run, run fast, run far. Um, and so even if there really is no immediate threat, if we anticipate that threat is coming our way, we are already starting to, to flee from whatever's going on or certainly getting prepared to flee and we'll flee at the earliest warning signal of what's going on. And so from an emotional intelligence perspective, this would mean that people that are this far upgrid are running away from things that aren't really threatening them. And so mm -hmm. lots of avoidance behaviors would be going on here. If you look outgrid, we know and then in order to end up in the outgrid danger zone, you have to perceive your level of ability as being extremely high. And the challenge that you face is extremely high. And so your survival strategy is which one? You got four to pick from. So which one's happening out here? You got to fight. This is fight. fight. This is absolute fight. And so... Now, that's great. If you've really got something that is a worthy opponent, again, challenge is high. You think your ability is high. You've got to be the superhero. You've got to be ready to fight and win. Well, how often have we seen executives take a very defensive or aggressive posture, fighting and arguing and, you know, all of those outgrid negative behaviors when the truth is there is no threat? 
in their mm-hmm. environment. But nevertheless, these bullying behaviors, these abrasive behaviors are going to happen because of what Brian said about the anticipation. Now, let me add one more thing to what Brian said there. Serotonin, or rather dopamine is its own reward. Mm -hmm. Dopamine wants more dopamine. So while this person is fleeing or fighting, or to finish it all off, they might be freezing, they might be fading if we're in the other two uh, danger, uh, danger zones. Nevertheless, there is something about fighting, even when there's no threat present, that rewards you. So somehow mm-hmm. or another, you're getting off on it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and as a result, that behavior is likely to, what do you guys think, uh, reduce or expand? expand? Slow down or continue? Continue. And so bullies yeah. are bullies, not only because they've gotten away with it, but because they keep getting away with it and they like that feeling. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so again, this is not a place where you're going to find very much either natural emotional intelligence, and you're certainly not going to find it uh, a, a situation where people are going to use whatever emotional intelligence they've learned over the course of their of their lifetime. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then there was one more neurotransmitter you mentioned. I believe we were now see that's the dark side of the change grid where all this comes together. Acetylcholine, no. Oh, the endorphins. Uh, and so one of those four subquadrants for emotional intelligence is where you get the endorphin rush, where you get that endorphin high. So it tends to occur, endorphins tend to be released when you're in a situation that is both relatively upgrid and outgrid. That expressive driver is living on endorphins. So they're mm-hmm. driven to do it. They're enthusiastic. They're moving, moving, moving. They're not being a bully. They're working it as best they can. That emotional intelligence is in full operation. And so very influential, paying attention to everything, working all the angles. Um, and while they might be, my verb was getting off on it, they feel very proud of themselves or whatever. There's nothing shameful in their behavior where people that are any of these outgrid danger zones or powerless points could very likely uh, find themselves upon reflection um, thinking poorly of themselves. Yeah, so the endorphins create like the morphine effect. So it's kind of like when you're doing things behaviorally that far out, you don't even feel the pain of actually what's going on. Like you, you, it'd be hard to stop you. Right, right. Right, right, right. Yet it's not that dopamine um, addiction that right. comes along with someone's quest for power for so no for no other reason than to have it. Um, okay, so uh, with that kind of like to bring us all uh, back online, I think we t- t- talked about most of the major neurotransmitters. He, um, if yes. you don't mind, could I ask Brian a question? I'd By all means, feel free. Hear his input on this. Um, But uh, how does emotional intelligence tie to what I would call situational awareness, where you have uh, individuals like maybe a Navy SEAL type of an individual that needs to be very self-aware of what's going on around them Mm -hmm. in the situation and how this ties together? Because I see the two things very, very similar. Yeah, they do tie together. You got to remember those guys, like we talked about that before in one of our calls where... Um, the military prepare for what they call a VUCA world. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And so they actually train themselves for that. Like think about their snipers when you're a ranger or a SEAL. They train themselves to, to interact with their environment. See, when we're talking about emotional intelligence or anything that's innate to a person, context is a co-conspirator. So it's not just the behavior itself as a single actor. There's always these co-conspirators, the environment, their experience they bring to it, their thought processes in the moment. So that's situational. And they can do that. The problem with some of them is they don't know how to turn it off. (laughs) And that becomes the dark side of it. It's the same thing like when we see actors and they say, oh, I'm a method actor. And they become the parts when they played like a cocaine addict or something. They don't know how to turn it off. So emotions can be very dangerous because, again, these things happen under what's called a subcortical process, which means they happen underneath the radar of awareness. 
And so unless we actually train ourselves to be more cognizant of mind body connection, that kind of thing, we, we just, you know, kind of pass it off as, ah, whatever. And Boris, to just expand on that for just one second, I want to just make sure that uh, everyone on the call is reminded that each, every individual has their own complete change grid. But my mm -hmm. definition of cornerstone uh, experiences and behaviors that would be the hallmarks for each of these different locations we talk about could be very different than yours. So for example, as someone who is not a sniper, I can tell you that when I think about what a sniper does, my immediate reaction is that, well, they must be a driven driver. I mean, they've got a lot of ability, but they're dealing with a situation that is so challenging. It's just amazing. If I was that sniper, that sniper would say, no, it's not. I'm in the middle of the change grid. For mm -hmm. me, this is just another day at the office. And while I, while others may think I have a great deal of ability, I can't take it for granted. I have to pay attention to what's going on. My training will take me a good deal of the way to the desired outcome, but I must remain alert. I must remain open. And all that ability to, uh, to identify and absorb and utilize information is best in the exact center of the change grid. Um, and so I would say to you, you're absolutely right uh, in that there is a relationship between emotional intelligence and whatever the situation at hand may be. Just keep in mind that that situational response is relative to mm -hmm. whoever the individual happens to be. I would hate to say, hey, this is where you want to be on the grid to be the best sniper. Well, actually, no, I don't mind being said that. If you want to be the world's best sniper, you need to be in the center of the change grid because... Yeah. And Brian can, can do this. Dopamine is not your friend if you're a sniper. Even mm -hmm. noradrenaline, certainly adrenaline, is not your friend. Mm -hmm. So you need mm -hmm. to stay in that very centered place where serotonin is giving you that, uh, well, you know, the situation doesn't lend itself to like a Zen experience. <laughs> but there are people who would say, no, I find I'm at a very peaceful place when I pull that trigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah Brian, and it's no different than like a pilot. You know, think about a pilot. They go into simulators and practice crashes. So, but in a real situation, like the pilot that landed on the Hudson, they get the same jolt of fear, but they're trained to make choices and decisions that are reasonable for that situation, given the circumstances there. But they train for that. See, these kinds of things, when we're talking in age, these are curriculums that we're just not taught. And for the most part, in most corporations, they pass it off as soft skills. And so they just don't pay attention to these kinds of things. Yet the greater portion of decision making starts at this level and then interact with the reasoning cortex again. Because again, this is key information. I always see emotions as key data, like key information of what's going on. That's where the change grid will give you some relevant data to how people are really contextualizing their current experience. And then you can use that to really help them to move to more favorable locations. Right. Um, so it sounds like to me, if I understand it correctly, um, emotional intelligence is definitely something you can train towards. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everybody mm -hmm. can get better at it, mm -hmm. but this is our caution. So we're talking about a, a lot of the programs that we end up looking at for integration into the change grid, or even for being worthy for the circle to, to talk about, um, are often being presented as complete solutions in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we kind of go like, well, I get it from a branding perspective or from your business perspective. Fine, go ahead, position it as a, as a complete thing, but we know better. So we know that emotional intelligence is something that is occurring under a certain set of circumstances. It's easier for people who have more of an innate emotional intelligence than it does for people who weren't born with any and had to learn whatever they've had to learn. Um, but nevertheless, anyone can learn to do it better. But even if they've learned to do it better, depending on what's going on with their level of productive tension, they may be unwilling or even unable to tap into the emotional intelligence they already possess. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really important. So that when we look at someone's change grid, 
And we see that they have activities plotting anywhere other than those four qua subquadrants. And again, we'll get very specific about which behavior should be where. But if we see they're plotting elsewhere on there, very downgrade or whatever, one of the things that we can certainly tell you is that they are not summoning all of the emotional intelligence that might be useful to them at this particular point in time, depending on the activity. Not all activities require emotional intelligence to be done perfectly. So um, usually emotional intelligence involves some sort of interactivity. Uh, T, that's, yes, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. But you know, I understand you when you say when, they, when you find yourself in such a position, the grid that you cannot tap in maybe. But I think that emotional intelligence is also uh, preventive, uh, uh, has a preventive mm -hmm. uh, function. Mm -hmm. So it helps you in the first place not to get to that position. Mm -hmm. And then the other side, if you get to it, you you should be able to to uh, get back to where you want to, to recover be. So more quickly. It's, it's both sides, yeah. Yeah, well, I think you're absolutely right because if you think about what we're doing when we're talking about using change works or any of the tension management training and coaching and all that, we're always trying to help people to operate more effectively in these four sub quadrants. You know, they're trying to accomplish something. That's what these engagement rings are really all about. And the better we can, we can help them become at these um, uh, behaviors, if you will, these insights and behaviors, it is interesting that it does make them more resilient and so as they find themselves in situations that prior to us working with them, they would have, uh, they, it would have derailed them. Um, now they go like, kind of like, oh yeah, that's happening. And to Brian's point, they can see it, acknowledge it and let it pass on by or, um, you know, not put more in So I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. Everyone is going to be better off by being emotionally intelligent. I just yep. want to make sure that we're all comfortable with the thought that emotional intelligence does not tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we have to understand what's going on with the people who are either again, um, I want to say emotional ignorance. Is that what David suggested we refer to? Because it wasn't emotional stupidity, <laughs> but emotionally ignorant. Some people just don't know how to do it. It's never been modeled for them. It's never been indifferent. Oh, yeah, indifferent. That could be it as well. But there's always a conscious, deliberate choice available to people. So do I want to use this particular skill set or do I just not feel like it? If I'm too far downgrade, I've done empower apathy or apathy. You think I'm going to pull into play all my emotional intelligence skills? No. No, why? You're quite comfortable where you are. I'm comfortable where I am. I don't particularly care <laughs> <laughs> about what's going on. So why should I put the energy into it? And the people who are perhaps out here in the driven driver danger zone, for them, this all this stuff associated with emotional intelligence is unnecessary. People just need to do exactly as they are told to do when they are told to do it and not grumble about it. I mean, that's this driven driver kind of mindset. It's like people just do it or, or go away, you know? So the, 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 that, that's that energy. So they may very well kind of go like, oh, really? So I've got to go and I'll make sure everybody feels okay about it. And by the way, I've shared with you guys, I've done training programs all over the world. There are certain cultures who actually just operate with the um, starting point belief that everyone who's working for them was hired with their eyes wide open. They've agreed to do the work. They've agreed to do it in a particular way. And so why should we have to do anything to motivate them? So their whole thought is like, no, I hired them to do this. They agreed to do this. What are we even talking about? when it comes to that sort of thing dragon you just chuckled got something you want to throw in <laughs> no i mean i am recognizable <laughs> yeah <laughs> dragon is in the netherlands <laughs> so let's just say some of his neighboring countries <laughs> don't make a whole lot of uh, room for him <laughs> worrying about how people are feeling about whatever it is they're doing just, just do it you said you'd do it i'm paying you to do it do it <laughs> yeah. so yeah i love it and by the way, that's just not that's not just the mindset of whoever's in charge. That's the mindset of peers. If they hear someone grumbling about the work that they're doing, they kind of look at that person and says, What are you grumbling? You decided to be here. So just do it. And you know, 
<laughs> move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. All right. So it, it, yeah, hey, I have a question. Sure. Uh, when you were talking about when someone may plot down grid, um, and Brian was talking about uh, times when it may not be at our level of consciousness. Uh, mm -hmm. Would that also right. represent that particular part of the grid? Could be way down grid. Things are, uh, remember we looked at the adult learning theory. We said on the in-grid quadrant, people are um, um, unconscious incompetence. As they become aware of their incompetence, they move up grid and become a conscious incompetent and they work hard at boosting their ability to develop the competence and so now they end up out grid. But as they do it more and more and more, the perceived challenge goes down, ability stays high, and here they are as an unconscious competent. And while competency is something to be celebrated, unconsciousness can cause trouble. And so that's what he's talking about. It's no longer on your radar. You're not even aware of it anymore anymore. And um, even if we look at the engagement rings, this big one here, I'm kind of scrolling through that connects the upgrade and downgrade powerless points uh, and danger zone, bulk of the danger zones in both cases. This is uh, pre-awareness or hypo-awareness, sorry, hypo-awareness and hyper-awareness as well as that pre-awareness kind of stuff going on. So it's very <laughs> possible that they're absolutely unaware. And even if they are aware, what level of uh, value do they attach to it, level of care and consideration they have around it you're in power apathy or apathy to be this far down grid apathy to be all the way down grid so what do you think yeah part of the reason i was uh, well one of the things that uh caused me to think about i was on uh, clubhouse not long ago and there was this real big debate where there was uh there were a group of folks on that call who felt very strongly that there was no such thing as being unconsciously biased and felt that it was just some some stuff that a bunch of psychologists are trying to get us to believe. But there was a, mm. definitely a strong thought that uh, we could not, as individuals, we do not uh, find ourselves as unconsciously biased. That we're I, my, uh, my assumption would have been that most of our biases are unconscious. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. So. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, oh. I'm trying to think of something that I just saw. It was the lyrics of a song. Actually, there's a video up on YouTube of a singing group called Voctiv singing the Disney princess medleys. And I know this feels like it's going to be totally unrelated. But when you listen to the lyrics of the princess's song from um, You'll Learn Things You Never Knew You Never Knew. I'm trying to think which princess that is. Uh, but I think there's one that was about native populations. But I thought like, wow, that lyric right there bypasses most people. But they said that when you when you walk in someone's shoes or whatever, you will learn things you never knew you never knew. And I thought, oh, that's what we're talking about. That's that little moment of awareness that says, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that I didn't know this. And that moves us, by the way, back into being, uh, you know, we went into being a unconscious, incompetent. Now I'm conscious again, and I start paying attention to it. Learning occurs by going around and around and around the change grid. And as we learned, we talked about spiral dynamics. That learning moves us as individuals, as groups, as cultures, as societies, further and further up the spiral dynamic. Yep. Uh, okay, so... Well, that was quite a little setup for us to get to this little part I want to talk about. <laughs> so, so the question is really simple. Uh, we, we, we said, look, all these productive states uh, that they're describing um, tend to live in those uh, that particular region of the change grid. If we pulled out the comprehensive adjective map, we could find the exact location, the exact coordinate pair that would be uh, the epicenter for each one of these states. But what about these other ones? So what I want you guys to do is I'm going to put up a change grid. I'll just use the, the, the composite grid. You guys know all the layers, so I don't need to drag you through it layer by layer. Um, but I'm going to ask you where these unproductive states live. And if I'm not mistaken, I've chatted this over to all of you guys. So I've got this. I'll slide it in the screen for just a second. Why is that so tiny? 
I've got this Genos page right off their website and it has these descriptions. As you work your way down the page about what these dimensions are all about and what they meant by the two extremes. So disconnected. Where would you say someone uh, would need to be on the change grid to be disconnected? And I'll give you a quick uh, reading here. So self-awareness is about being aware of the behavior we demonstrate, our strengths and limitations, and the impact we have on others. Leaders with high emotional self-awareness are characterized as present rather than disconnected, both from themselves and from others. So with that as the definition, where would you say someone is most likely to be present or perceived as present? And uh, where would disconnection perhaps be at its worst? Any thoughts? Say that question again. So where on the change grid would you expect the person to be most present? And again, they're defining that as being aware of the behavior they demonstrate, their strengths and limitations, and the impact they have on others. So if you have those things, you would be described as present. And if you don't have those things, you would be perceived as disconnected. So I think a little bit, sorry, go. Go ahead, Dragan. No, I was just wondering, is the present maybe a little bit out grid of the center? Yeah. Um, I was going to say the center, maybe. And I'm going to say anywhere from the center to out here into this amiable driver yeah. place. Maybe okay, yeah, just here, the general vicinity, you're present, but you're not imposing yourself. You're aware, but again, at the exact center of the change grid, you're totally uh, detached. There's uh, a bit of attachment that occurs the moment you're even a, a micro millimeter away from uh, for that center of the change grid, you begin to attach yourself to whatever is happening in the four cardinal directions. And so maybe I'm connecting myself to whatever the desired outcome happens to be or the mission, the vision, the purpose. Maybe I'm connecting to whatever is going on that's creating some sort of a puzzle or whatever, but I'm present. And because my thought is that I don't know that I would really be considered as present if I was in fact um, as detached as the center of the change grid is really um, all about. Right. Yeah, got it. So for me yeah. to be present, well, if I'm only present for myself, fine, the center of the change grid is great. But if I want others to perceive me as being present, then I would have to be a little bit further out grid. Because if I'm just sitting there in a Zen lotus position saying, Om, I don't think anyone <laughs> is going to think I'm paying attention <laughs> yeah. to what's going on. So, uh, so certain circumstances, the center, but for the most part, I think we need to be in the little, if you will, the halo, the glow of the center of the change grid in more of the upgrid and outgrid kind of field. So there I'm present. Now disconnected, where would you say, uh, we'll go to the other extreme, where would you say profound disconnection tends to live on the change grid? Mm. Could I'm be two in, spots, right? Up Could and down. Two spots. Oh, yeah. 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 Maybe I'm yeah. too far upgrade. Maybe I'm too <laughs> far downgrade. Exactly. Do you think the person who's too far outgrade could also be disconnected? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell us about tell us about why, Chris. Why do you think they might be disconnected? Well, it could be disconnected from reality and relationships, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to emotional intelligence, because if they have a mindset of being that bull in a china shop, they're not considering others. It's all about them, all about what they want, all about mission critical um, task or KPIs that they want to accomplish. And they're going to do it no matter what, by any means necessary, That's which will right. damage That's relationships right. and cause a disconnection into getting meaningful things done. That's right. So again, if we go back to Genos's definition, self-awareness is about being aware of the behavior we demonstrate. Mm, right. Outgrid, maybe they're aware, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to stop them. <laughs> Their strengths and limitations, of course, they only think they have what? <laughs> strengths, no limitations. <laughs> and the impact they have on others, they could not possibly care less. <laughs> so, you know, so. it's interesting, T, also, because the further you go out, you, you start, you head all the way into in-grid. You do. Right, because again, of how the points are connect. So they go right into a state of being even beyond being pre-aware. That's right. Just not, yeah. 
That's right. And it's, so if I bring up this, remember that the four danger zones are neighbors with one another. So mm -hmm. while you might get into this powerless area outgrid, you can instantly move upgrid, ingrid, or downgrid into any of the neighboring danger zones. So remember, we can depict the change grid as a sphere, as a cube, as a cylinder, mm -hmm. lots of things to help us uh, better understand how humans are operating. Okay, go right so ahead. So then this connection can happen in any danger zone, basically. Any danger zone, I would say. Now, maybe it's a little bit less likely on the Ingrid side of things. Ingrid is the one we all understand the least because they tend to not be our clients and they tend to have issues that are beyond the scope of services most of us would end up providing. So this is the profoundly timid, timid reclusive, um, uh, super low self-esteem. This is the person who their way of dealing with, uh, with struggle, dealing with threat is to fade. They wanna disappear into the background, cause, call no attention to the themselves whatsoever. And so we've often said they exist, but they don't live. What did I just do? They exist, but they don't live. Um, and so generally, these are not people we encounter in our work. We encounter people that are way up in stress and are desperate to find some way out of their predicament. And we encounter plenty of, of executives and business owners that are big bullies and wonder why they can't keep a staff. And we deal with a lot of people who are very far down grid, who have had some success and they're resting on their laurels and now they're getting bored and, and building up. This is where our work is. Upgrade, outgrade, and downgrade. We don't encounter all this many, but if we were talking to the psychologists that are in the circle and the physicians that are in the circle, I'm sure they'd say like, oh no, we see plenty of these people. So, mm -hmm. uh, and so, even so, by so the way, we've had people with a uh, background in the, uh, in the judicial system, courts and all that. They certainly, these are the people that are victims. So these are the abused. These are, you know, these people exist. They just don't tend to be our clients or, uh, you know, involved in the work that we do. Mind you, that being said, how many of you know executives who have as their uh, key administration person, secretary, whatever, this person who for whatever reasons is more than willing or is just used to getting just abused by this outgrid energy. So they're both profoundly dysfunctional but for some reason they found each other and they can work a way that you know seemingly is productive, but we know it's unhealthy. Okay. So T, T basically they, it can happen in all the danger zones you're just talking about different in intensity, right? Different intensities and different ways that, uh, that that disconnection might express itself. Hmm. For example, if I'm in the upgrade danger zone, I, my disconnection is a result of me being preoccupied by something that is threatening me. And so the reason why I can't be present, I can't connect is because the situation is demanding my immediate attention. So for example, if we, we are talking about a business setting and we're having a very important discussion meeting with whatever, and we're all sitting there having our thing and we need everybody to be present and, and participative and all that. And someone on the team gets a tweet that their kid was in an accident at school and has been taken to the emergency room. I promise you, they are going to disconnect in that moment because that situation is going to move them very far upgrid. So I don't know that we would want to judge them as a disconnected person or someone. In fact, if anything, what they've just done is trying to say, I got to disconnect from this because I got something more important I got to connect with. So I need to be present for my child. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so you get the idea. So I don't know that this is, um, a reflection of their lack of emotional intelligence as much as it is. I, in fact, I think it was Boris who brought up speed is a circumstantial. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Hey, T. Yeah. Hey, on, on the topic of disconnecting, I would like to hear from Brian. There's a quote <clears throat> I came across and I immediately thought of Brian about the possibilities of this. It said, feel the feelings, but don't become the emotion. Witness it, allow it and release it. So is that possible to, to that you, is that really possible, Brian, that you can do that? You can feel the feelings, um, but be disconnected from the emotion. Nice. Yeah. You, you move into that. That's the Diane Buffett method. So I think, was it Tim on the call that was describing how he teaches 
the um, his uh, clients and the bias, and he walks them through yes. like what what it is they're experiencing. That's that's exactly it. Because again, the you you're we're designed to give emotions the upper hand. Because all of the emotions, pathways, right, it processes information, the senses immediately. Like it operates fast. So we're designed to give the emotions the upper hand. But when we resist it, then we don't have the right data to even respond in the most favorable way. So in other words, feel, be angry, but understand why it is that you're angry and understand what you can do to respond in a most effective way. But if you deny the fact that you're angry, then you're already setting yourself up to misappropriate that use of the senses. So we kind of try to squat those things down. I remember as a foster parent, to take the kids to uh, anger management training and they simply have them like count to 10 as if that's going to work. Well, they just simply get angrier. But they're not taught how to deal with those feelings that they're having. It's like, you know, so I used to just simply tell them, hey, I don't have anything to do with you being in a system, but I can help you work through it. So in other words, I'm meeting them where they are. They seem to be able to calm down. But then I, you know, it's just an evolving process to help them come to terms with why they're so angry. And it is a process. So when I hear things like emotional intelligence and they set it up as this is best practices, it's a setup for failure because best practices assume there's finality. And when it comes to emotion, um, you know, Boris said, it's, it's situational, that question that he's asked, it's always situational. And so we can't base our effectiveness and success based on the last event where we responded. It's a continuum, but we're designed literally, the body and the brain is designed to give emotions, these senses, the upper hand. Like we're designed to experience them, but then utilize that emotion for its greatest use, if that makes sense. It does. And let, let me add to that, uh, that I know many of us on the call are practicing meditation or uh, martial art or anything like that. We very much have to be able to separate the feeling, and I'm talking about a physical sensation, mm -hmm. from our emotional response to that physical sensation. So when you are sitting in a position for a long period of time and discomfort suddenly comes to your awareness, what do you do with that information? So is it some, is it physical awareness that is, or is it a feeling that is bringing you a warning that you need to change your position? Uh, otherwise your foot's going to die and fall off because there's no blood circulation. <laughs> or is it just kind of about like, no, I can feel the discomfort and continue to do whatever it is that I was doing. Brian, is that just, is that illustrating what you're talking about? Absolutely. And that's what uh, Joseph Ledoux in his book, The Emotional Brain, he's a neuroscientist at NYU. That's exactly how he describes the emotions. And that's the basis of all that he uh, studies. So he says, there's a difference between the emotion response, that's the sensory, the trigger, something happened, and the emotion feeling. Those two are different pathways in terms of how they're contextualizing information that's going on and bringing those two together. So when we talk about the midbrain as primary responsible for emotion processing, it's like a major hub. So it's picking up senses from all over. And this is why your, your memory, your amygdala, all those things are coming together at one point. So it's like a major conjunction. So without self-awareness, without this idea that you can actually do something disconnected from emotion itself, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble all the time. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I just want to make one final point on this first um, uh, core competency, and then we'll, we'll finish this up on the next time around. You know how I like to leave things as organic as they need to be. And then, Chris, I think uh, I'll let you throw in what you want to say. I just wanted to say that it's great for us to talk about all these things and you know understand the merging and blah 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 blah. Um, but what about when we're looking at someone's change grid? And let's say the activity is uh, serving as a as a good member of a team, and they're plotting down in power apathy or apathy, or they're plotting too far up grid or whatever. We should be able to look at that plotting and go, I know from Genos's uh, model that they are not present. 
Um, and so if they are not present, how does that affect their ability to perform on a team? How mm -hmm. are they disconnected? How is their disconnection expressing itself? What's what might be triggering the disconnection that if it wasn't triggering disconnection, they may otherwise be present. So something is distracting them from it. So I think it's always important as we look at these models, we look at the change room, we go, where does present live on the change grid? Where does disconnected live on the change grid? And then as we look at specific activities, we can then say, well, that one requires someone to be more present. How do we move them to that particular uh, location? Okay, so with that, yeah, Dragon, go right ahead. I, I'd just like to uh, ask Brian something. Brian, please, uh, you mentioned a couple of times a name which I couldn't uh, hear well. Uh, Damon Buffing or Damon Oh, yeah, Buffing well, yeah, or... I'll, I'll tell about Diane Bufflin. Diane Bufflin <laughs> is, uh, is a member of the Circle of Brilliance. Um, she's a clinical psychologist uh, in Michigan that we've known for years upon years. And she has this specific technique that she uses with her clients to get them out of their uh, emotional brain and get them into their cortex. And um, so it's come to be called the Bufflin Maneuver. And the Bufflin Maneuver is for you to just, whatever you're feeling, stop for a moment and just say, isn't that interesting? How very interesting, because that pulls you out of the emotional state and puts you into a cognitive assessment sort of a mode. And so now instead of being in the feeling, you have, you have disconnected, you have somehow or another dissociated, and you are now observing yourself and asking, isn't that interesting? What's, what's causing that? What's bringing that? And the moment you start doing that, you are, I mean, instantly, you are out of your, um, what part of your brain am I talking about, Brian, where everything's in motion? The hippocampus. The hippocampus. The yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So mm -hmm. we're being pulled out of limbic system. You were getting pulled yeah. out of that limbic system and into our, into our cortex. Mm -hmm. But so that's that, also why we count to 10 and take three deep breaths, because that allows us to shift from the emotional to a higher level where we, and, and I think all of this is overridden by conscious choice. You know, mm -hmm. feel the fear and do it anyway. There's a conscious choice that overrides this. And going back to what you said about biases, T, they mm -hmm. are unconscious. I mean, there's belief that 100% are. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact is that's not going to go away because that's learned associative behavior. But we can make a conscious choice to know mm -hmm. that we don't have to follow that path. We don't have that's to right. act. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. So. Yep. Awareness is the first step on the road to recovery. So, um, okay, well, like, as I said, uh, we're at the top of the hour. I think this has been a really nice uh, discussion. So if you guys uh, are uh, open to it, we'll continue with these remaining. Is it six or seven core competencies? I oh, there are six total, so there'll be five remaining. And we can uh, look at those on our next call on Tuesday and um, you know, see if we can work our way through them. Uh, any final questions, comments? Yeah, T, real quick. So the, the about the quote, feel the feelings, but don't become the emotion. That, that ability to disconnect, does that, to be able to make that separation, will that happen at 6-6? Six, six? Yeah, that happens at the center okay. of the change grid. Whatever that center is for the individual, that happens at the center of the change grid because this is where we have the natural, not even the natural ability, we end up somehow or another um, dissociating from whatever's going on. We seem to detach. And once you're detached, it's uh, the, the next thing is, is observation. The only thing left is observation. I so. think that's very nicely put. You have uh, the feeling, the feeling, then you then you make the choice and then you express it. For, that's correct. For way. That's correct. And, it, 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 and you can learn it for sure. Well, that's right. That's what all anger management is. They know, okay, you're feeling the anger because something triggered that anger. From that point forward, it's about choice. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we'll work on helping you cope with and get rid of the anger, but the first thing we got to do is stop you from doing destructive behaviors, and you have the power to stop yourself. So, you know, they made me do it. Nope, they didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, with that, uh, we're done for now. Boris, thanks so much for joining us. You're always welcome to be part of the circle. So hope you'll fit us in again. Happy. You just gave me great. Really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. You just gave me great disappointment. Are, are you saying that after all these years, um, 
Flip Wilson was wrong. The devil did not make me do it. The level, no, <laughs> Flip Wilson was wrong. The devil did not make him do it. That's funny. <laughs> it was a great excuse, wasn't it? It was. It was. Well, he was his own devil. That's the thing, you know. Yeah, we we try to justify our behaviors and explain them in any way that seems reasonable at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I like I'll it. have to use that one. That was great. Yeah, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Okay, all right. Uh, great talking to you guys again. So have a wonderful weekend. And uh, assuming the state of Arizona has not burst into flames, or that Linda and I have not personally melted, we will join you on the call on Thursday. So uh, thanks everybody. Bye, everybody. Good one, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.